The Bible is filled with stories of new beginnings, and many of them are tied together by a common theme. Let's start with the release of Israel from 40 years of Egyptian slavery. Exodus tells us that after escaping Pharaoh's army through the power of God, Moses and the Hebrews arrive at Mount Sinai. On the mountaintop, Moses encounters Yahweh and receives the Ten Commandments. No longer slaves, the people need a new identity and a new way to live. So God reminds them of who they are, where they've been, and how they're to live in future. Exodus says, and all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses took the people's answer back to the Lord. Fast forward to the death of Moses and the conquest of the promised land by his protege, Joshua. After victories against cities like Jericho, the Hebrews are about to go from a nomadic people in the wilderness to an entirely new nation. So God has already made arrangements for them to continue their new story and remember how to live. In Deuteronomy 31, God tells the people, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid and don't panic, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. And when Joshua does subdue the land, he reads the law publicly to his people so they don't forget how they got where they are and what God expects. He's told, at the end of every seventh year, you must read this book of instruction to all the people of Israel when they assemble before the Lord your God. Call them all together, men, women, children, and the foreigners living in your towns, so they may hear this book of instruction and learn to revere the Lord your God and carefully obey all the terms of these instructions. Do this so your children, who have not known these instructions, will hear them and learn to revere the Lord your God. Do this as long as you live in the land. Notice the process. Hear the scriptures, learn to revere the Lord, obey his instructions, and teach the next generation. But that practice seems to peter out. Before too long, the people of Israel fall into idolatry, driven largely by a desire to be just like those around them. And that lasts for centuries. And it's the same today. At a time when the Bible is more readily available than ever before, record numbers of people are not reading it. Respect for God is way down. Modern idols are still very much a problem and we have a couple of younger generations that know nothing about God or His church. But history tells us that lack of respect for Scripture does not have to be the end of the story. About 600 years before Jesus, a spiritual revival takes place during the reign of a king named Josiah. 18 years into his reign, he gathers money to repair the temple. And during those renovations, the high priest finds the long lost book of the law. When the scriptures are read to the king, He tears his clothes in despair, recognizing his nation has lost its way and that God is not pleased. 2 Kings 23 tells us, the king went up to the temple with the priests and prophets, and all the people from the least to the greatest were there. The king read to them the entire book of the covenant, which had been found in the Lord's temple. Josiah renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence and pledged to obey all his commands with all his heart and soul. And all the people pledged themselves to the agreement. Never before had there been a king like Josiah, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, soul, and strength. And there's never been a king like him since. 
Josiah tore down all the foreign idols, got rid of the pagan priests, and used scripture to turn the hearts of the people back to God. Regrettably, it doesn't last, and the nation is carried into captivity by the Babylonians of ancient Iraq, and there they stay for 70 years. Then God orchestrates their release through the work of two leaders named Nehemiah and Ezra. The Jews are given permission by the Babylonians to return home and rebuild Jerusalem, which they do, both the walls of the city and the temple inside. Another new beginning and a fresh start. So what does Ezra the priest do? Nehemiah 8 tells us, on October 8th, Ezra brought the book of the law before the assembly, men, women, and all the children old enough to understand. And from early morning, he read aloud and all the people listened closely to the book of the law. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. And then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And from that point on, the people rededicate themselves to an obedient faith. They remain distinctive from those around them, and they hold fast to God's commands. In fact, reading scripture together becomes a core practice in Jewish life. It's done each week in the synagogue, and even Jesus takes part, choosing the reading of Scripture to launch his ministry in a fuller way. Turning to a passage in Isaiah 61 about the coming of the Messiah, he applies the message to himself, and the people are divided. Some are amazed and impressed with what he says, and the seeds of faith are sown. But others are deeply offended when he challenges their preconceived ideas. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And when the church begins to spread after the resurrection and the people of God begin yet another new chapter, the public reading of scripture is again front and center. It's like the Christians are right back at Sinai. They need a new identity. They have to remember how they got where they are, and they must know what their lives are supposed to look like. And those answers are found in the Word. So in 1 Timothy 4, Paul tells the young preacher Timothy, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Later, Paul adds that God breathes life into scripture, which is useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Then as now, scripture plays a vital role when it comes to both encouraging and teaching. We can learn from those who've gone before us and we can more fully obey God if we know what he's like and what he wants but it kind of begs the question. In a day and age when we have the Bible in our homes and even in the palms of our hands, why do we need to read the Word together? Where's the power in that? Well, to begin with, there are some practical considerations. First, we're easily distracted when it comes to private reading, and not all of us do a very good job of being consistent. Second, 
Reading the word only through the filter of our own experience and insight is very limiting. There will be lots we don't see, and we'll likely get plenty of things wrong without the sharing that comes with reading and studying with others. Third, there's great comfort and encouragement in knowing that we're all in this together. Though each of us needs a personal, consistent relationship with God that reminds us of our individual value to Him, we must also remember that God's plan for humanity goes far beyond us and that we're part of this great, unbroken chain of faith that spans human history and will one day culminate in the return of Jesus. Fourth, we need the accountability that comes with community. When we're part of a loving and supportive church family, people will give us the freedom to think for ourselves, but help us see through the harmful, half-cocked heresies that have troubled the faith from the very beginning. Doing scripture together keeps us growing, keeps us united, keeps us encouraged, and keeps us safe. Reading scripture in community and then discussing it has always been a part of how God's people operate. So although preaching and teaching are good and necessary, the Holy Spirit can also give us wisdom and insight when we just share the word. And it doesn't have to be either or. Preaching and teaching and sharing fit together nicely. Of course, one of the advantages of a small church is that we can build dialogue and discussion into everything we do. So when I preach, anyone can interject a question, a comment, or an insight from their own experience. In the same way, all our classes are built around that same approach. People are free to share ways we can apply scripture to the pressing issues of this generation. We all come away enriched and it's entirely consistent with how the early church did things before a more formal top-down format took hold. So as we stand on the threshold of a new year, this is a new beginning for us and the times are uncertain. So God wants us to come together and remind each other of the same message he gave the people of Israel when they faced doubt and turmoil. You have seen what I've done, he says, you know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me, you will be my special treasure, my kingdom of priests, and my holy nation. But just as in the days of Joshua, we're bound to face opposition and anxiety. So collectively, we must affirm the promise of God as we step into 2023. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid and don't panic. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. But in response, we must forsake the modern idols all around us and rededicate ourselves to knowing and obeying the spiritual principles that have been largely lost in our wider culture. We must rediscover the power of Scripture and use it to instill a greater sense of God's might and majesty, then teach the next generation. It's the only way faith will survive. In many ways, it feels like we've been in exile. For some time now, the people of God have been overshadowed by cultural forces that sometimes make us feel like captives in a foreign land. But just as he did with the Jews, God has given us a mission to rebuild and restore his kingdom in this place. We are to be different and distinctive, but with love and light, not pride and arrogance. So, like all those before us, let's remember who we are, how we got here, where we're going, and what we're supposed to do in the meantime. Let's read and heed the scripture together. 
Let's hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let's think of ways to motivate one another to love and good works, and let us not neglect meeting together as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is getting close. And we do that most effectively by sharing the gospel with each other, because there's great power in Scripture and it will change our lives. We've got God's Word on that. And the blessings are greatest when we're all on the same page.